Now for a big picture view on, you know, are we at the brink of a trade war? We're joined by Raj Bala. He is, of course, a Bloomberg Queen columnist. I'm sure you've read him often on our site and associate dean at the School of Law at the University of Kansas. Raj, uh, good evening to you. I know it's late night. Thank you for doing this. Uh, let's start by asking you what you think the worst case scenario in this could potentially be. As of now, it's only steel and aluminum. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you and good morning. Uh, the worst case scenario is a global trade war that covers many more commodities beyond steel and aluminum and uh, also results in World Trade Organization challenges to the United States, which the United States then invokes the national security exception. And if it loses the case, simply ignores the WTO ruling. And even if it wins the case, other countries start invoking that same exception. And we're headed down a slippery slope of many countries taking so-called national security actions. So it's both uh, a, a parade of horribles economically and politically. Uh, what's the probability you're attaching to that scenario, Raj? Uh, probably at least 50 50 if not more already other countries uh, uh including the european union has said that they will challenge the united states in the wto um, and also other countries uh the eu china uh, for example have already uh, decided to look at what uh, products they can uh, retaliate against uh in the united states and you mentioned some in your intro piece like kentucky bourbon uh, Wisconsin cheese, Harley Davidson motorcycles, Levi's blue jeans. So this is the sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, metastasization of uh, what is uh, just steel and aluminum. Uh, and it goes to many, many sectors uh, that have many downstream implications. So I would say much better than 50-50 at this point, especially given what the administration officials went around this morning uh, on the Sunday morning talk shows in the United States saying, uh, which was no country exemptions, perhaps at best a few product specific exemptions. And basically the rhetoric has been, uh, bring it on. Uh, well, let me break up the implications of this into two parts. One is, what does a global trade war mean for the global economy? Uh, you know, and, and therefore growth rates, this was promising to be a year of much higher growth rates. And the second part of the question is, where does India stand in all of this? Because we rank much lower as a trading partner with the U.S. Um, but yet we've heard President Trump, you know, make threatening noises uh, towards uh, imports from India as well. Right. Well, let's start with the second question first. India is vulnerable in, in, a, in, in, in not only in steel, but also in aluminum um, and in particular products like, for example, flanges which are used in naval vessels and aircrafts, which the United States has said, well, we feel threatened by uh, Chinese and Indian flanges. Um, India is also vulnerable in terms of its great potential, the potential that the Modi administration and indeed all of India has been looking forward to greater trade and investment ties may be nipped uh, uh, rather quickly um, if this trade war uh, worsens. Um, and I think also India has to be careful in the sense of the, its vulnerability in terms of diversion. If, for example, Chinese or Korean or Japanese or Brazilian steel diverts away from the American market and then is put into the Indian market, that puts pressure on Indian producers because of the diversion. So in other words, third countries, uh, uh, third country shipments are a threat um, to India, all because of this action. Um, and, you know, your first question about um, what will this look like? Well, it's the it's the potentially the beg a rerun of the beggar thy neighbor policies that we saw in the late 20s and early 30s, where each country is trying to export uh, unemployment and export uh, wage declines to other countries. And it's a chain reaction. Um, and that's what we might be seeing. And that is a, definitely a very scary prospect. Mm. Raj, uh, good morning or good evening to you, Neera Jaya. Just one question, how, uh, how difficult would it be for some of the large trading partners uh, if this does become worse 
to shift away from uh, U.S. imports into other territories. I mean, there's a lot of talk about how, you know, well, China, what if it stops importing planes from Boeing and goes on to other, uh, you know, goes on to Airbus, etc. But it's not as easy, right? There are huge cost implications for each of these to consider, even if they're not happy with the U.S. actions. Yes, that's true. It, it, do, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, we, it, 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 and it depends on the company and the product. I mean, Hyundai, for example, has said, well, maybe we will not invest so much in our plants uh, in the American South. Maybe we will um, uh, scale back production. Uh, and so, so over time, the, the, the global value added chains that have, uh, have included the United States will change. But again, it depends on the, the company and the, the specific um, product. It's, it's hard to make a, a general assessment. But I would note here that um, Section 232, the remedy legally, does not, uh, President Trump has not said that there is any particular end date, that this could go on, I think, uh, to paraphrase his words, for a very long time. So companies are going to be looking at changing their supply chains, given the uncertain length of the trade remedy actions they are victimized by. All right, Raj, we're going to have to leave it there this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, I, I know this is only the beginning of this, and we'll be back speaking with you if we see any further aggression from the U.S. when it comes to the building up of this potential trade war. Raj Pala, they're talking you through it.